Welcome to lecture 17. Uh, last time we started talking about uh, regulation, and we, we saw a couple of examples of that. Uh, I will talk about that a little more formally today and introduce the Zener diode and uh, just look at it in a little more detail. And uh, then I'm hoping to, and, and we'll see how you can just put together uh, that as a stage uh, in your power supply after the rectifier and filter stages that we've talked about extensively. And then after that, uh, I'm hoping to look at a few other applications of diodes quickly, hopefully based on the, the insight that we've built so far, we can go through a few applications quickly. And so we'll see how far we, we go. So this is it for today. So the concept of regulation, which is what we started last time, is, is basically this. If you're trying to get a, a constant voltage somewhere, essentially a DC voltage source, you want a, a current voltage characteristics where basically you can have any current at a fixed voltage, right? And with the diode, we saw that the, the IV characteristics of a diode are like this, current versus voltage, something like this. You have the forward bias and then the reverse bias. And so we saw that both this and this are, are closely similar to, to something like this, almost a, a straight vertical line. Not entirely, but approximately. And in the real world, things are approximate. So if you could somehow use a diode either in the forward mode uh, when it's pretty uh, on, so that it, it has a, a large enough voltage, and that would be, let's say, somewhere around 0.7, that its current voltage characteristics have reached that point of being almost a straight line. Not quite, but it's an exponential increase, so it's going up fast. Or if you are in the breakdown mode on the other side where you have a straight vertical, uh, this, this time downward, we saw that you could tap into this property and regulate a, vo um, a voltage that's varying between two, two values. So I want to just elaborate on that a little bit. And this, this is the basic concept. This is the basic concept. Let's say you had a voltage that was varying between two values, uh, so had, had some variation. Or maybe let's just assume a, f a fixed voltage for now, but we'll change the value. So you have some, some input voltage here and something like this. This is the circuit we looked at last time. If we put a diode here, uh, if we put a diode here like this, we can try to use it in its forward mode and get a, a voltage across that, that resistor that's about 0.7 volts. Or we could use a diode the other way around and try to use it in its breakdown mode and get the breakdown voltage across that resistor that's in parallel with the diode. So I'll look into this in more detail. Uh, before doing that, maybe I, I, I'll just point out uh, something about the schematics of how, how, how we draw these circuits. It's not a new concept, but remember that now we've, uh, you know, it's been some time when, since when we started to, to also use node voltages and mesh currents. And so in electronic circuits, as you build more and more bigger circuits, it's very common to represent some of the uh, nodes very explicitly. So, so for instance, instead of a circuit like this, I might draw something like this. So if I say this node is at V in with respect to this reference, let's call this reference. What is the difference between this circuit 
and the previous one that I had, where I had shown the, the voltage source explicitly. Can anyone point out what the difference between these two is? Between what I just had, where I had shown the voltage source explicitly, and this? There is no difference. This is just another representation. Because if you see something like this, you can imagine in the back of your mind that this is what you have. Because the voltage difference between those two nodes here and here is that V in. Okay? So sometimes you, you represent things in that more brief manner where you show a voltage source by indicating the node voltage and you skip drawing that source explicitly. So this arrow here is basically indicating a node voltage. But remember that image, that in the back of your mind, you're thinking about that voltage source being there. Now, this reference, it does not have to be connected to, let's say, the ground of your building, but sometimes it is. And again, very often in an electronic circuit, you have a, a common node somewhere that you actually do connect to ground. Uh, for instance, if you have in, in your lab, you're connecting one of the nodes to the ground um, side of the probe of your oscilloscope, but you're actually physically connecting that point to the ground of the building. And in that case, you would then explicitly say that this is the ground node. <coughs> and commonly, you assume that ground is at zero volts as, as a reference point. OK, so your reference is ground. So this is one way to show things. And uh, you see this in some of the pro problems that I have uh, posted online for you. So I have a question here now. If I show this, instead of like this, if I show it like this, what is the difference? What is the difference between these two? Is there any difference? Let's look at another, another aspect of this. Look at the current going through ground here in this circuit. And look at the current going through ground in this circuit. So these two currents, call them I1 and I2, the two currents that I've indicated on these two circuits that we said are equivalent. Let's see what's happening here. Are these equal? So let's ask another question. Let's look at current I2. What is the value of I2? If I put a box here, if I put a box around this whole thing, and if things are really isolated like that, there is no other connection to the outside world. So if there is only this, this wire connecting to ground, OK? If I2 is non-zero, it means over time there is accumulation of charge in that. This is essentially a violation of KCL, because think of this whole box as, as a node that things go 
you know, you have currents going in and out of, and you have only one current going out of it or, or into it. That has to be zero, OK? OK, so if I2 is zero, then what about I1? Is I1 also zero? So if I have some current going down here, and then it splits into this current, let's say, and this current, well, these two have to come here, add up to I1. So there is some current there. I1 is not zero. So what's the difference? Now let's, let's complete the circuit, change it slightly to something slightly different. So if I draw it now like this, so I actually show this other, or let me draw it in dashed lines. If I show this Vn explicitly, if I draw it like this, you see, if now you put a box around this thing, you see that there are two wires coming out of it, this and that. And so current is going through one of them and coming out the other one. That's fine. The only difference is, in this case, I had connected those two wires inside the box. OK, so these circuits are not really different. But the way you draw them could have consequences as to whether or not there is some current going to your ground on, on your particular schematic. OK, so this is something that I wanted to point out because it's something that people make mistakes about. Uh, there's no fundamental difference here, but here in, in, in the representation down here, these two wires had been connected internally. And so th there, there was a complete loop inside the box, whereas here I had taken that outside the box and separated it into two, two wires. And so those currents were not zero. I1 is not zero, and there's some other current here to make up for it. Yes? Increasingly, we will draw things like this as we do more and more electronics over the next few weeks. And so that's why I wanted to make sure we are all on the same page about how to represent these um, node voltages and ground. So maybe let's just give this that title. Uh, representing node voltages and ground. Now back to regulation. So now I'll allow myself to more, more freely use this representation. And so consider having this, this circuit. So let's call this R, R1. Call this node voltage V out. And you see, this would be equivalent to, to saying this. V out is the voltage difference between the two sides of this resistor, or equivalently, because the bottom is held at ground, which normally we, we assume is 0 volts, then the node voltage here is V out. So I can use that representation and say this is V out and this is V in. Okay. This, this symbol here is the Zener diode. So it's, it's a diode, but it has very uh, interesting reverse characteristics, a very sharp vertical reverse uh, characteristic, or sorry, breakdown, very sharp uh, vertical breakdown. Uh, so let's call this V and I, like we've been doing so far. And these are the characteristics of the Zener diode. I'll give myself more room on the left. 
So this is the forward mode, and this is the reverse mode. With oh, can't do a good job here with a sharp drop. So this is V versus uh, no, sorry, I versus V. Now pay attention to the directions that I have chosen as my convention for the polarity of V and I, same as a regular diode. This is the way you would normally choose the polarities for a diode. But also notice the way I have connected the, the Zener diode. So the way I've connected it for, for that polarity, this is my V and this is my I, just like that. This is a Zener diode. What you are trying to do with this circuit is the same function that we, uh, we looked at through an example last time. Uh, so we did a numerical example. And I don't want to repeat that numerical example, but just to point out that the goal was to have a relatively fixed V out. And so to operate somewhere around here, where you see that without much change in the voltage, you have a, a whole range of currents that your device can let through. And what this does for us is that when you change V in as the as the voltage input changes in this circuit, for, for quite a range of variations in that input, the changes in the current of that uh, resistor R1 will be absorbed by this diode in its reverse mode. Now, you see the voltage V is a negative voltage in this case, right? We are here this yellow highlighted region. So V out, which is the reverse of V, or the inverse of V, or sorry, the, the negative of V, is, is actually a positive voltage in this case. So you're using the Zener diode in its reverse mode, and you're connecting it like this, so that you get a positive V out in this particular circuit. Now we want to analyze this in a little more detail and see how we can make sure that we actually get something, let's say a, a V out, that's somewhere here, right? That's my goal. So if, if V is here, V out, which is minus V, would be, the, the negative of V out would be here, okay? And so V out is a positive number. This is my goal, and for that, I have to make sure that things are such in the circuit that the solution to the circuit falls somewhere here, okay? That's just solving a problem including one diode with known characteristics. But rather than looking at the exact characteristics of this region, which, which is, as you can see, quite a nonlinear transition, and there's something you would have from the data sheet. But rather than looking at that exactly, what I'd like to do is simplify it a little bit. Oh, sorry, too far. As it's commonly done. So look at this region. Remember how for the forward mode of the diode, we did this piecewise linear approximation to approximate it with, with a straight line? Uh, with some slope, we do the same thing here. So imagine I approximate this in this range with a straight line that's tangential to it, like this. It's not a very straight line maybe, but you get the idea. I approximate it with that. That would simplify my analysis quite a bit. If I say, if, if I give some, some names to these points. So this is a straight line, and I call this point 
minus vz naught. And I say the slope of this, slope of this line is 1 over rz. The slope, meaning the, the ratio of, in this case, change in current divided by change in voltage as you move on this line. If I have this, how would the, or, or, or uh, and, and if my Zener diode in this circuit is operating in this mode where I can use this representation, what should I put instead of the Zener diode as an equivalent circuit, as a model for it? So if I'm somewhere here, if I'm in this range here, where things are a, a, a straight line, how can I represent I and V in that range, uh, or the relationship between I and V in that range? It's like a resistor, but with an offset, right? So now, because we are working with the diode in the other direction, it's also common to say, well, instead of using, using that V and I that we have, which are negative values, let's use the negative of those, which will be positive values. So let's use, instead of this, let's use this current, which is Iz, which is minus I, and let's use this voltage, which is Vz, which is minus V. Okay. So if I were to write the relationship between Vz and Iz, which would be some, some voltage and current here, so this point would be minus Vz, and this point would be minus Iz. What is the relationship between Vz and Iz? Right? It's just a straight line with an offset. So if Iz is 0, if I'm on the axis, Vz has reached that value Vz naught. If Iz is increasing, Vz is also increasing with that linear increase. Okay. Now you might find this a little confusing to, to choose the reverse or the negative of the normal diode voltage and current directions. But this is the convention that's commonly used in these circuits with Zener, uh, Zener diodes, so it's something to get used to a little bit. And if you, now, if you look in at, at this equation, what is the circuit that gives you this relationship between its voltage and current? It says, constant voltage source, it's a battery, plus some resistor in series. This is essentially like a, like, a Tevnan, like a Tevnan model, right? You have a voltage source plus a, um, a series resistor. So if I now put that in, my circuit becomes like this. If this is V in, instead of the diode, in this range of operation, I include that little Rz in series with that, that little battery, or you can, yeah, is the symbol a battery or a voltage source, Vz naught. R, and this is V out. So I have replaced the diode with this. And this is this is Iz and this is Vz. Okay? I've just replaced the, the diode with that. So the analysis of this circuit now becomes quite simple. 
And this was R1. Okay, a very simple circuit to solve. And so for a given value of V in, you can find V out. As long as you have this equivalent model for the Zener diode. And this is something that you would get from a data sheet, for instance. You would have this, so you can draw this tangential line and find Vz0 and the slope. And then you can put that in and calculate the output voltage exactly. And you, you would expect that this Rz is a small value. Because for a good Zener diode, this, this line would be pretty vertical. So now imagine I give you this, this circuit, the circuit right here, and I say, find the output. Can you do this? Or there's something else to be concerned about? Can you just take Vz0 and Rz from the data sheet, put them here, and be done? Or is there something else to, to take into account? This sounds a little too simple to be true. Any thoughts? Well, you see, if if you knew for sure that the diode was operating around here, then yes. As long as you're happy with that approximation, yeah, you can do it. But how do you know that the diode is actually somewhere around there and not here, or not here, or not here? How do you know that? Or put it another way, if you are trying to design a regulator where you want your diode to operate right here. How do, you, how do you make sure that that happens and the diode doesn't end up somewhere else? Because if it does, then, so, so imagine if, if it's in most of this reverse mode where you have a very, very small reverse current and a wide range of variation for the reverse voltage. Well, your output is directly connected to the diode, so the output voltage is, is swinging. That's not a regulated voltage. Or if the diode ends up in the forward mode somehow, because of whatever your input is, well, the output will be whatever this forward region tells you. So it works as a regulator, and, and you can apply this model if you are in the right range of things. So how do you go about designing a regulator to make sure that things are working properly and the diode is where, where you are? Well, you have to make sure that the diode is somewhere on that blue line, which means kind of more or less beyond this point. Let's, let's call it this point. And you might say this is somewhat perhaps arbitrary, depending on your taste. But again, this is something you would find from data sheets. That point beyond which you could say the diode is more or less on that straight line, and below which it's, it's not. So this is called uh, the knee current and voltage. So IZK, and the knee on that curve. So it's the, the point beyond which you can say more or less the diode is on that straight line. So how do you make sure that your, your current is more negative than the knee current and your voltage is more negative than the knee voltage so that you can operate there? If I say design a regulator and you know what your load is, so I give you, I say you know you have a, a 10 ohm resistor or a 10 kilo ohm resistor to deliver a given output voltage to. And I'll give you a Zener diode that has a Z naught, a VZ naught around minus 10 volts. 
and I say your input is, you know, let's say the output of a, a filtered rectifier circuit swinging between 15 and 14 volts with a stripper. How do you go about completing the circuit? The only thing that's missing is R1, right? So let me write this down. And I want you guys to think about it a little bit, and then uh, I'll, I'll uh, elaborate. So imagine you want to have a specific V out value delivered to load R. So you know V out and that's, that's your design specs. And you have a Zener diode with a VZ knot around the desired V out. So that's a good start. Because if you didn't have that, well, it was a non-start. And you have a V in that is varying between some minimum and maximum value. Some minimum value and V in max. How do you find R1? I want you guys to think about that for a minute. So this, this is really a simple regulator design. How should I go about picking R1? What, what are they, where's the starting point? So now, that's a good point. If, if I write all my KVLs and KCLs and analyze them in, in their full glory, I, I will eventually get to the uh, solution. But now I want to take more of a, uh, a design type of approach where you start thinking about the constraints of the problem and seeing what are the, what are the trends. Now, if you have any, any, positive, uh, any positive IZ current, you will see that V out is a little higher than VZ naught, right? So let's say if you wanted a, a V out of 10 volts, maybe you want a VZ naught of 9.9 .9 or something, right? Uh, as you can see, in this circuit, there is no way V out is going to be fixed. It's just that its variations are going to be very small because RZ is very small. And as the current IZ changes due to changes in V in, the variations in V out is going to be small. But the point is, this V out is just the same as VZ, which is VZ naught plus RZ IZ. Now, if you know V out, you also know something else. You know this current. Let's call this, let's call this I, right? So you know I is V out divided by R. Let's start thinking about the constraints of the problem. First of all, I want my Zener diode to actually be in this Zener mode, in this reverse breakdown mode, where I can use this model. What does that mean? What is my constraint? The constraint is that the current IZ, the value IZ has to be higher than the value of IZ ni, IZ k, right? So that tells me that this IZ here has to be larger than a minimum value for me to be in the right mode of operation of the Zener diode. What constraint does that put on this current? Let's call this I1. Uh, 
Well, if i is more or less fixed, v out by r, and iz has to be above a certain value, that means that the sum of the two, which is i1, has to be above a certain value, right? If i1 is below that value, I will not have enough current to go through the diode and satisfy this condition. What is a situation that will lead to a very small i1 that could get me into trouble? Well, if r1 is very large, right? If I have a, a very large r1, the current i1 will be very small. So I have to make sure that the current i1 does not become too small. Because if it does, then I will not have enough current to feed the Zener diode. Now, during the cycle of operation of the circuit, as v in is changing, at what point do I risk having the smallest value of I1? Is it when V in is at, is at its highest or at its lowest? At its lowest. So what I have to be careful with is that as V in changes and reaches its lowest point, where I1 becomes lowest, still I1 is high enough to allow for the output current as well as a, a diode current that's greater than the knee current. So that's one thing I have to be thinking about. So, so one, uh, as V in changes with time, because it's a varying voltage, I have to make sure that the current IZ never falls below the knee current. That's one. And that gives me a limit on the resistance, R1. That tells me that R1 cannot be larger than a certain value. So basically what you have to do is this, this, this situation, the, the worst condition is when V in is at its lowest. So when V in is at its lowest, we have to we have to see what the current i and um, iz would ha uh, would be then, which is uh, the the, the sum of which will give you i one. Okay. And, and that's that. that. That will then tell you the, the maximum value of uh, the maximum value of the resistance. If R1 and, and by the way, at, at the limit, uh, the limit happens when IZ is is just IZK, right? So up to that point, you're saying it's okay, which means VZ is VZK, and so you have VZK, uh, which is your V out, and you get I, and you have IZ, which is IZK, and so you get I1, and then from that. R1, and this is the maximum value of resistance. If you put a resistor there that has a larger resistance, when V in reaches its lowest point, the current I1 will be too small, and it will not have enough capacity to both drive the output 
and the Zener diode in its breakdown mode. Okay, so that's one. What about the other side? So, so if I want to make sure that R1 is not too large, so I find the maximum value like this. But why do I need R1 to begin with? So if, if I want R1 not to be greater than this, should I just use R1 equals 0? That will make sure that it's never <laughs> larger than whatever limit I have. Why wouldn't I choose R1 equals 0? So if I put R1 equals 0, I'm directly connecting Vn to the to the diode, right, and the output. So if I have R1 equals 0, V out is just equal to V in, right? And it means I have put the V in directly across the Zener diode. Now imagine, like in the example I mentioned, that V in is changing between 14 and 15 volts, OK? And my Zener diode has a breakdown around minus 10 volts. So if I, if I try now to go on a point on this, on this graph where the voltage is 14, minus 14 rather than minus 10, I'm way down here, right? The current, so I, I have driven this Zener diode all the way to, to an extreme case. So let's say it wants to be around here, but I'm forcing it to have a voltage here. So it will have a huge current. So First of all, I'm not regulating my output because I'm directly connecting the input to it. Second, I'm driving this Zener diode with an extremely large current. And most likely, it's, it's burning. It's, uh, it's quite violently destroyed. Um, so, so you do need a resistance there, OK? But we, we found an upper bound for it, an upper limit for it. What should the minimum value of that resistance be? What should the criterion be for the minimum value of that re uh, resistance? What we just discussed. You want it to be not too small, certainly not zero, as we just discussed, not too small so that the diode current does not exceed the maximum amount that the diode can actually physically handle. right? So it's determined by how much uh, current the diode can handle, how much power it can dissipate, right? Uh, so, so that's your other concern. Now, when is it in the cycle as Vn changes, when is it that you have the, r the risk of driving too much current in the diode? Is it when Vn is at its lowest or at its highest? When is it that I, I risk having too large an IZ? Is that when Vn is small or Vn is large? It's when it's, when it's large. So the other criterion that we have then is as Vn changes with time, I also have to make sure that Iz never exceeds the amount that the diode can handle. Again, coming from the data sheet and not be destroyed. The risk of that happening is when Vn is at its highest. Calculate I1 and then use it to find the minimum
value allowed for R1. So if, if you look on the graph, you're going to say somewhere around here, maybe this is my red line. I don't want to, to, to go beyond this point. I don't want to have a current higher in magnitude than that. And so I don't want you know, the, the product of the voltage and current to go beyond a certain amount of power. So I put a limit there. Well, so if, if I put a limit, and again, this is something that the manufacturer would tell you for a given uh, component. Then you would say, well, you know, if, if I know this voltage and current for the diode, if I go on the circuit, if I have Vz and Iz, well, I have Vz, so I can calculate V out. So I know V out, sorry, it's the same thing. And so I can calculate I, and I also know Iz, so I can calculate I1, which is the sum of the two. And I know that I, I have to make sure that I1 um, is, is not more than this when V in is at its highest, right? So I have V in at its highest, I have Vz, and I have I1, so I calculate R1. And then I know that the resistor R1 should not have a value lower than that, because if it does, at some point in the cycle, Vz and Iz will become too high and the diode will be damaged. Okay. So these are the two design, uh, design criteria, if you want. So now with this view in mind, maybe go, go through the example, the numerical example that we did last time. Uh, there we, uh, I think, uh, you know, I, I didn't specify it as a Zener diode. I didn't draw it with that symbol, but same, same idea. So try, try that numerical example again with this insight that you have. But this is the essence of regulator design. And so your Vn comes from whatever you have from the previous stage of uh, your power supply after your regulator and filter. And then the V out would be uh, what you're trying to get. And so you need to come up with a value of R1 in the range that is allowed, OK? So I just need maybe two, three more minutes to now complete the diagram of the DC voltage source that we started. If we wanted to include everything that we have talked about, We will start with an AC input. Put a transformer here in order to scale it down to an appropriate level. And then the first thing is to uh, rectify it. Let's use the full wave rectifier in this case with a bridge. So this is the design that we've seen before. And now if we connect this directly to our load resistor, we would get a rectified output. But of course, that, that is, uh, that's not anything near a constant DC voltage. So we are going to, uh, first of all, filter this by adding a capacitor in parallel. Right? But that's also not enough, because now we have a voltage at the output that has a small ripple, but a, a, a notable one, anyway. Uh, so. So what we'd like to do next is to use a regulation stage to get rid of most of that ripple and so regulate the output voltage. And for that, uh, 
So we still have our filter here, or filtering capacitor. And we will just put in a regulator stage, such as the one that we've been discussing. And then put the output here. So this would be our load resistor, and this is where we get the output voltage. So let's go ahead and label these different stages. Here is simply a scaling of the AC voltage. Here we have the rectification. Here we have the filtering. And finally, regulation. And this gives us a complete DC voltage source. And if things are properly designed, uh, that is, if we have chosen the right parameters for the different components, we should get a pretty nicely regulated DC output voltage. OK, so we'll take our short break here. So fortunately, we are done with, the, with a good chunk of really the discussion on diode, because we've seen uh, how it interfaces with other things. And we've seen at least two very specific functions here. One is rectification, and the other one regulation. And so now I'm going to just go quickly through a few other examples of applications of diodes. And you know, ultimately, applications are limited by your imagination. So this is when, uh, where, where an electronics designer would start using the diode in any, in any, any which way they think they can uh, use it to create a functionality. But uh, maybe something that, uh, that some of you might be interested in is logic circuits, right? Because uh, let's say if you want to do computing, uh, you have to, to build functions like AND and OR, right? Gates. So some example applications of diodes. Consider this circuit. Let's call this V1 and this V2 and call this, say, some or some v, v, VS, some source, or, or yeah, VCC, let's say. Okay. And let's say this is V out, and this is my ground. So this is a reference node that I have somewhere. If I say that node is V out, that means the difference between that. And let's assume these are ideal diodes. What is V out if think about that? Uh, if, if V1 is VCC and V2 is VCC, so let's say VCC is 5 volts and V1 and V2 are both 5 volts, what is the current here going to be? So let's say this current is some, some value, some positive current in that direction. Then what does that say for V out? Then V out will be less than VCC, right? If V1 and V2 are both the same as VCC, and this is less than VCC, 
So if this, this current i is greater than 0, the out will be less than VCC. And if the inputs are at VCC, then are these diodes forward or reverse? They are reverse. So there will be no current going through them, right? This is 0 and this is 0. Right? So where, where does the current I go? It has nowhere to go. So you see, uh, so, so I'll write that down. If I greater than 0, then both diodes reverse. So nowhere for I to go. So, so I has to be 0, which is a contradiction with it not being 0. It follows that actually i is 0 in this uh, case, and v out is vcc. Because there is no voltage drop across that resistor. Okay, now let's consider another scenario. What if, let's say V1 is zero and V2 is VCC. So if this is zero, and this is VCC. What will V out be? Again, you have different possibilities of all the diodes being on and on or off. Well, here's one thing. So imagine these are, again, ideal diodes. Can you tell me in this circuit what is the maximum value that V out can have? If V1 is 0 and v, uh, V2 is VCC, what is the highest possible value that V out can have without damaging things? V out is indeed VCC minus this current times that resistance, whatever that is, right? So let's call this R. That, that's always the case, right? But I'm saying in that particular circuit, if, if I have put V1 at 0 and V2 at VCC, under this condition, if I want to analyze the circuit, well, I want to think about it, what's the highest possible value that V out can have in this situation? So imagine I claim that V out, so, so let's say VCC is 5 volts, and I claim that in, in this circuit V out is 2 volts. Does anyone see a problem with that? Yeah, exactly. And, and let's say if it's an ideal diode, its maximum forward voltage is 0 volts. It can't go above 0 volts. So V out cannot be above 0, actually, right? Because of V1 equals 0, V out cannot be more than 0. Now, what is V out going to be? What is the actual value going to be? Is it going to be 0 or something negative? Yeah, so I said it's, let's assume it's an ideal diode. Oh, so I'm, I'm neglecting the point 0.7. Yeah. But yeah, in reality, it would be around 0.7. Well, let's see. What if V out is 0? If V out is 0, then let's see if things work out. Because if things work out, that's the solution. So if V out is 0, the first diode is happy, right? 
what about the second diode? What happens to that? Is it forward or reverse? If, if V2 is VCC and V out is zero, the second diode, is that forward or reverse? It's reverse, right? So that diode is reverse. There's no current going through it. That current I is just going through the first diode. No problem. And, and V out is going to be zero. So V out is going to be zero. Again, I'm assuming ideal diodes. Maybe I should write that down for now. V out will actually be zero. And the current I going is, is going through the first diode that's on. The second one is off. What if I had the reverse situation? If I had V1 equal to VCC and, and V2 equal to zero? Same solution, right? It's completely the same problem. The, same, the two diodes are in, in, in exactly the same configuration. So, and, and finally, what if I had both diodes at zero? What would the output be? Uh, sorry, both inputs at zero. What would the output be? It would be zero again, right? But instead of the current all going through one diode, it would be uh, split between the two, right? Let's recap what we saw. We saw that if the two uh, inputs are both at VCC, the output is at VCC. If one of the inputs is at zero, or both are at zero, the output is at zero. What function is that? That's an AND. So in summary, if both inputs are at VCC, then V out is VCC. If Either input is zero, then V out is zero. Either input or both. This is an AND function. OK? That's a simple AND function. So now you're starting to enter the realm of logic. Uh, now a little exercise. Everything we did before was illogical. Design an OR circuit for, to do on, at home. Do it on your own. It's a good little exercise to do. Not now, at home. If we look at the circuit, if we have one of these, so let's say the, the top one is at 0, why is it that V out cannot be greater than 0? It's what this diode, the top diode, is imposing. Because if V out is greater than zero, it means you have a forward voltage on this. Uh, it, it, so if this is an, an ideal diode, this forward value maximum is zero, right? In practice, if you had a, an actual, you know, real diode, it would be more like 0.7 voltage. So this wouldn't be more than 0.7 volts. But for an ideal diode, just to simplify the problem, any current can go through with zero forward voltage in an ideal diode. Okay. So th the diode is actually you might say putting a, a, an upper limit here. It's limiting there. And in fact, I was just going to, to show another application. So here, one is logic gates. Limiting circuits. Consider this. 
if I have a circuit like this, let's call this V in and this V out. What is V out in this circuit? Zero. <laughs> no matter what you do to V in, because one diode does not let V out go positive, the other one does not let um, V out go negative. So assuming the diodes are ideal, if the two diodes are ideal, V out will be zero, no matter what you do. So if you try to, to go one way, one diode is unhappy, the other, the other does. So regardless of V in, if V in is positive, the current will go through the left diode. If V in is negative, the current will go through the right diode, but the voltage is zero. No, no, uh, if ideal diodes voltage drop is not always zero, forward voltage is zero, right? They can still be reverse voltage. Other question? What if they're not ideal diodes? What, what if they're more realistic diodes? If the diodes are more realistic, so let's say approximately 0.7 volt in forward, Then what can we say about the output? It can swing between 0.7 and negative 0.7, but not beyond that. So if I were to, to draw, uh, to, uh, to show the, you might say the transfer characteristics of the circuit, if I were to plot the output as a function of the input, so as I change the input, from a very large negative value to a very large positive value, the output will not change beyond that plus minus seven volts. So this, this will look like this. And of course, the slope there uh, of change depends on the diode characteristics exactly and the, the resistor, but qualitatively it will look like this. And this is approximately 0.7 volts. And this is minus 0.7 volts. Again, I'm not showing the exact shape of this, this uh, curve. And you know, if, if the diode really stays at 0.7 volts fixed, this, this line here, this saturation, would be a perfect straight, flat, horizontal line. And, and same on the other side. But in reality, it's not exactly 0.7. It varies uh, by, by a small amount. And, and this happens after V in has, now, so this is not exactly to uh, scale. Maybe I should change the, to make it look a little more to scale. I'll just redraw it. It's more like this. More like that, right? Because once V in reaches something around 0.7, if V in is less than 0.7, there will not be enough to turn on that diode and have some current also go through the resistor. But once it reaches 0.7, that's when that diode turns on and the output will more or less stay the same. Same on the other side. Again, this is approximate, right? As in volts. So you have created a limiting circuit that, you know, no matter what you what you do, you you're ensuring 
that the output does not go beyond a certain limit. Now, what if you wanted this limit to be a little higher? So what if you wanted this to be, instead of 0.7, maybe more like 1.5 volts? Well, you could just stack some diodes in series, right? You could put maybe five of those diodes, and you would get approximately uh, three, three, uh, three and a half volts, right, on each side. And these are actually this kind of circular things that you do use, uh, for instance, for protecting a part of another circuit, an instrument. So you're limiting the voltage. Here's another circuit, okay? That's called a clamping circuit. So let's say I have this V in. And I do this. And this is V out. And let's assume that V in as a function of time is this. is some square wave. So this is V in. What is V out? Think about that for a minute. Let's start where, uh, where the input is at some negative value, okay? And assume initially that the capacitor had no charge, and you put the input at that negative value there. So the capacitor, let's say, was zero, and all of a sudden you start applying this input, and you jump from zero to that negative value. What will happen if you all of a sudden pull the left-hand side of the capacitor down? from zero to this negative value. And imagine the capacitor is uncharged. It starts charging because remember, the capacitor doesn't like a sudden change in voltage, right? So if you, if you try to bring down the left side, the right side will follow. So if, if you drop this to, let's say, minus VP, call this minus VP, then the, the right-hand side, V out, will, will want to drop to, to minus VP, which means the diode is actually going to become forward biased, and very strongly so. What if VP is 2 volts? That's actually not very good because either the capacitor is not happy because you will have to force it to suddenly change its voltage, or the diode will have to sustain positive 2 volts will become forward biased. So, so what happens in reality is, of course, there is always some parasitic resistance. And as you know, the diode characteristics go up very steeply. So what happens is, yes, there is a little bit of a, a violent behavior there in that the capacitor doesn't want to change its voltage suddenly, but it's open to changing it very fast, very quickly. And so what happens is when, when you do this suddenly, you're momentarily sending a message to the diode that you're going to bias it very, very positively forward. And so the diode current is going to shoot up, which means now you have a very high current to charge the capacitor. So the capacitor will charge, charge up very quickly. You see? So of course, none of this happens instantaneously. There is a transient, and that transient, you can solve for it by actually using the, the IV characteristics of the diode. Again, another one of those numerical problems if you wanted to solve accurately, the kind of things I've been talking about in the past and for which I gave you an example in the, in the problem sets. From the outside point of view, 
what you see is if you had an ideal diode with zero volt difference, it could basically provide you infinite current. An infinite current can charge the capacitor instantly, right? So with a good approximation, you would see the output drop immediately to, to what? To zero, <laughs> right? So if your input was zero and your output was zero, there will be that split second, and you might say, depending on the situation, maybe split microsecond or split nanosecond, where there is some transient on the output, but very quickly it will stabilize to zero. And if you have an ideal diode, it will take no time. The output will stay at zero, which means the capacitor has, has charged up, OK? So now the capacitor is charged with a voltage difference of Vp in this direction. Uh, which direction? Right? Because the output is minus Vp, and then plus Vp, you get zero at the output. Uh, sorry, the input is minus Vp, plus Vp, you get zero at the output. Uh, so, so this blue one is Vp. Uh, sorry, is V out. The blue one is V out. Maybe I'll show this with a different color to avoid confusion. Now we reach this point when you see that the input jumps from minus Vp all the way to plus Vp. Let's say it's symmetric. What happens then? What will happen to the output? If, if the input all of a sudden jumps from minus Vp to plus Vp, well, let's see what the tendency of the capacitor is. The capacitor, again, tends to want to keep its voltage, right? So if the capacitor has a Vp voltage like that, and you change the left-hand side, you increase the left-hand side by a value 2 Vp, what happens to the right-hand side? It also changes by 2 Vp. So the capacitor will tend to keep its voltage unless you can charge it. Now, is there something that would prevent that from happening? In other words, does the diode turn on to allow the capacitor to charge or discharge to, to prevent this from, the ha uh, from happening? Well, let's see. If the capacitor voltage, uh, sorry, if the output is going up like that, it's all in the positive, that diode is completely reverse biased, right? There is no current going through it. So that diode is off. There is no current through the diode. The capacitor is in series with the diode, means there's no current in the capacitor. So the capacitor does not charge or discharge. It will retain its voltage. If the capacitor retains its voltage, it's indeed consistent with the output being there. Now you reach the point where the input falls down by 2 Vp. What happens? So now you reach this point. Then this all of a sudden falls down. Well, the capacitor wants to follow again, right? Because the capacitor doesn't like a sudden change in its voltage, uh, in, in the voltage across the two plates. So if you swing down the left-hand side, the right-hand side of the capacitor will also want to go down. And so it will go down to this point. At which point, V out has essentially barely become zero. It's not, not giving any, any momentum to the diode to turn on. 
to, and, and in any case, the diode will not want to discharge the capacitor, right? Because it would not allow a reverse current. You see, discharging the capacitor in that circuit would require the diode to allow a reverse current, which, you know, of course, in, in, in practice, there is a diode can be reversed a little bit or, or can have a small reverse current. But approximately, you see that after the first cycle, the diode actually is off and it stays off. And the capacitor will retain its charge, will retain its voltage, and this will be your V out. So this is called a, a clamper. And, and you see that, for instance, we had a, a circuit that had, again, zero average, and we created an average voltage for it a positive average for it. It's also called a DC restorer um, for reasons that we can uh, maybe talk about later. This is another application. Uh, there's, there's many other applications that one can t talk about, and there are different types of diodes. Um, some of them will make sense only when one talks about the physics of operation of diodes. But I'll just point out maybe a couple of things in, in one minute. And that's uh, when you hear of LEDs, what, what does LED stand for? Light emitting diode, right? It's, it's actually a diode. And um, what you, the, the, the operation of a diode, which hopefully at some point, maybe a little later, we'll, we'll talk about briefly, uh, involves electrons going from one side of a junction between two semiconductors to the other. And these electrons can you know, if you design the thing properly, you will favor these electrons losing their energy in the form of photons, particles of light. And that's how you create a light emitting diode. What is a solar cell? Let me just draw one, one diagram that hopefully will intrigue you. If I have the IV characteristics of a diode, and I somehow manage to shift them down a little bit. So if this is I versus V. If I am, so, so on the original graph, if I'm at this point, so I have a positive V and a positive I, and this is my diode. If V and I are positive, is this device consuming power or delivering power to whatever it's connected to? Well, V times I is positive. This device is consuming power, right? What if I have shifted somehow to the blue curve? And if I'm here, is this device consuming power or delivering power to whatever it's connected to? Same thing. V times I is positive. What if I'm here? So I have a positive V and a negative I. If that, if that condition is met, or, or if I'm at a point like that, there's a reason I used green for this, because this is a solar cell. This is the, the IV characteristics of a solar cell. It's a diode. When you illuminate it with, with light, with photons, again, one has to look into the, the physics of the diode. But the IV characteristics shift to the point that then you have this quadrant of the characteristics where the device delivers energy. And that's a, that's a photo, uh, photovoltaic cell, a solar cell. OK, so, so there is many things one can talk about. But I think for now, hopefully, we have motivated the discussion on diodes enough. And that's it for today. Thank you.